I think we'll make a start then. Um, let me welcome you to the fifth seminar in our series on global warming. Our speaker today is Jasper Kirkby, who comes to us from Switzerland, the CERN laboratory just outside Geneva, and he is, of course, a particle physicist by background. Um, Jasper took his first degree at Oxford, followed by his doctorate at the University of London, and then he spent 12 years at the Stanford Linear Accelerator before moving to CERN in 1984. He's been directly involved in the development of major detector systems and the experiments stemming from them at a wide range of accelerator facilities around the world, including the Brookhaven National Lab, Slack of course, CERN, and the Paul Scheer Institute in Zurich. Um, he's also credited with having had the bright idea for a Tau Charm factory. And I'm quite sure you wish you had one too. Uh, this led directly to the construction of the Beijing Electron-Positron Collider, which I believe opened in 2006. Well, the, the, upgrade, the, upgrade. the upgrade of that machine. Right. Um, today, he's the head of the cloud experiment at CERN, and so that's what he's going to be talking to us today. He brings a very different perspective to the question of global warming, in that he is a particle physicist by background, and I'm sure you'll find his talk extremely interesting. Jasper. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you, Colin, for the, and uh, the faculty for inviting me here to give this talk. Um, I, yes, I'm a particle physicist, but I've become, over the last 10 years or so, uh, very deeply involved in uh, an experiment which I originated at that stage, um, which is called CLOUD. And it's concerned with uh, whether uh, there's a, a connection between the cosmos and Earth's climate through clouds. Now, I have to say at the outset, we don't have the answers. We don't know if this is a fact, but there's a, a lot of uh, motivation, the scientific motivation, and I'll try and transmit some of that to you, uh, that's been obtained and we've just started measurements. We actually started with this experiment at the end of 2009 and we have our first measurements and I'll give you a flavour as to what we're starting to find. Um, but anyway, let me, uh, let me go into the talk. So just to set the context for this and I'll go quite quickly through these first few slides because I know you've been saturated by IPCC stuff over the last uh, few weeks. So all this is super obvious to you. But this is the... Uh, this is the global warming over the last uh, century. The particular thing I want you to take note is it's not just a warming that's happened since 1975, but there was an equivalent warming of roughly the same magnitude and steepness in the first half of this century. Okay. Now, uh, the total contribution, the so-called forcing agents that have been responsible for this, according to the IPCC, they sum out at 1.6 watts per square meter and the major contributor are the greenhouse gases, but mankind has also thrown up aerosols and uh, precursor gases, which have caused a cooling effect. They ha these have big errors. But anyway, that's the bottom line. The, uh, the understanding is that this is almost totally caused by mankind. It's about 1.6 watts per square meter of initial forcing. But very importantly, the IPCC and everyone, I think, on all sides of this uh, climate debate uh, agree that the understanding of aerosols and their effect on clouds is very poorly understood. Now, just to make sure absolutely everybody in the audience is very familiar, because I'm afraid you're going to hear the word aerosol several times in this talk. Aerosols are small clusters of particles, a few tens or hundreds of nanometer, uh, that are suspended in the atmosphere. They're typically a few hundred to a few thousand per cubic centimeter, or even more in polluted atmosphere. They're extremely important because they scatter sunlight, but much more importantly, they uh, form the seeds for cloud droplets. If there were no aerosols in the sky, there would be no clouds in the sky. So all clouds form on a particular seed. And when those seeds are present, if the relative humidity goes above uh, 100% by just a few tenths of a percent, then clouds will form. Okay? So these are the various contrib contributions to this, uh, this global climate uh, uh, temperature change and let me just draw your attention to 
one particular thing. The solar irradiance is thought not to have changed much, very slightly over the course of the century, but essentially dominated by this very small oscillation due to the sunspot cycle. But there's been an, a small net increase, just the average radiance, but it's very, very small. But essentially, the first part of this century, there was no contribution from uh, mankind's uh, greenhouse gases and so on. And that, you see, leads, even though it leads to a good agreement in the second half of the century, I would maintain that this is rather a poor uh, a representation of the data, the, the current models, and that's shown there. But the solar contribution, which is going to be the, 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 the topic of this particular talk, is definitely there. If you look at the sea surface temperature, this is the blue line, this is quite, mod quite small, this is plus or minus a 0.5 degrees, <coughs> excuse me, then you see the sea surface temperature oscillating and it oscillates essentially in phase with the solar cycle, actually with the irradiant cycle and uh, it has the right frequency and the right lead and so on. It's heavily damped because the oceans can't respond over a 10 year cycle to this, this forcing and that's why it's a much smaller effect. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so there is a solar signal uh, but it's, uh, it's thought to be very small and that was shown in the previous slide. It's thought to be only 5% of the uh, contribution from mankind from the greenhouse gases and so on. So clouds are very important, you're well aware of all this. Uh, they, have a very, they have a net cooling effect and you can see that a very small fractional change of clouds could have a significant climate effect. And in fact, there may have been some changes in the, radiant, in the cloud cover. We don't know, and these data are very poor, but this is what it shows over the last uh, 20 years. These are various reconstructions of the so-called albedo of the Earth. This is the, uh, well, this is what the Earth would look like in terms of its reflectivity. It would be below roughly 10% uh, if there weren't any clouds in the sky. But the presence of clouds causes a reflection of about 30% of the sunlight that comes in. So it's a very, very substantial effect. Uh, and it's, the question is, has this changed for any reason, systematically changed? And there are indications from several different measurements here. They're very difficult to make. They have big errors. They're independent measurements, but they, they certainly have huge experimental errors. But there seems to be some warming trend, decreasing clouds over the last uh, 15 years or so, and an increase perhaps, although there's a divergence in the data, over the last 10 years. Just to set the scale of this, this is the contribution of greenhouse gas warming over this, this period. It's about plus one watt per square meter. So you can see if, if there really is a decrease of clouds here that could have contributed to the, to the warming that we've seen over that period. Uh, it, it's simply reflecting uh, the lack of understanding that we have of clouds at the moment. Now, this, this cartoon is actually expressing, uh, th this is, you could say, the summary of what, what my talk is going to be. I have to say something about the sun. Well, this is, this is the possible mechanism that cloud is going after. <coughs> Uh, and there's a, there's a very important question mark there. Please do not think that this is an established process. It certainly isn't. There's a big question mark there. We don't know whether this is happening, and that's why we're doing cloud, why we need to do the measurements. But cloud is hoping to answer the question whether this, uh, this process happens or not. And in particular, it's answering this little corner here. But let's, let me just point out the elements. So that basically, the sun has its irradiance, which is warming the earth. It also has the solar wind, which is the plasma that streams off the sun. This is responsible for partially deflecting cosmic rays, which are basically produced in supernovae in the Milky Way. It partially deflects them and alters the intensity of cosmic rays reaching the Earth. The big question is, do these cosmic rays affect cloud formation on Earth? If they do, then clouds can have a very big effect on changing the insulation, the amount of uh, sunlight that reaches the Earth and there could be a climatically significant effect. So let me sort of quickly go through some of those elements. We'll look at solar and galactic, ray com cosmic, galactic cosmic ray variability. Clearly, what we're talking about here is variability. It's not the constant sun or the constant cosmic rays that matter, but are these things varying in time? And if they are varying, are they affecting clouds and climate? So this is uh, the part of the sun that you're very familiar with. This is what the sun looks like during the peak of the sunspot cycle. 
So these are sunspots rotating around with a periodicity, uh, uh, a rotation period of 25 days in the equator. That's what it looks like. But the sun has another nature. This is the, this is the temperature at which radiation is emitted from the sun and reaches the earth. So practically all of the solar constant, the warmth that re comes from the earth is being emitted from this layer that you're seeing now. And the only difference, if I were to show this picture during the minimum of the solar cycle, it would be identical in colour, Th these spots would simply have disappeared. So this is the now another view of the sun, but now it's being viewed at 20 nanometer wavelength. And this corresponds to about a million degrees, and it's looking at a, a, part, a part of the very thin outer atmosphere, the corona of the sun, um, during the solar cycle. Now this, this movie starts at the lowest point of the solar magnetic activity of the sunspot cycle and it's gradually building up in years towards the peak of a sunspot cycle and it will give you a graphical representation of the change in magnetic intensity on the, in the corona uh, during, the, during the, uh, the solar cycle. This, uh, these magnetic, you can see magnetic loops and so on and uh, recombinations which are ejecting actually large amounts of plasma from the surface of the sun and this is streaming out through the solar system and it's responsible for modulating among other things it's modulating the intensity of cosmic rays on earth so the question is there's clearly very big visual differences that you see here between the magnetic activity when the sun is quiet or very active and the question is does the sun do that uh, on a regular just an 11 year cycle or does it do it stochastically over long periods of many tens of years or hundreds of years and the evidence is that it does we don't know why but for some reason the sun's magnetic activity varies over these time scales I have to be very careful about time Colin what, what time is the end of the talk so alright um, ok so cosmic rays uh, cosmic rays are uh, protons, mainly protons, they're produced by supernovae in the galaxy. Uh, they may, uh, after a million years or so, traveling through the, uh, inter, uh, uh, the, the inter interplanetary, intersolar ma magnetic field, they arrive at Earth. And uh, when they arrive at Earth, they collide somewhere uh, in the top of the atmosphere, at the bottom of the stratosphere, and produce showers of secondary particles of which the most penetrating, the muons, get down to ground level. So the, solar, the cosmic rays are responsible for essentially all the ionization in the chamber, in, sorry, in the, yeah, all the ionization in the atmosphere, um, other than the contribution from natural radioactivity over land. They have a tiny energy input into the uh, Earth's atmosphere, something like uh, a billionth of sunlight so they're equivalent to the energy of starlight it's totally negligible energetically but because they control the ionization in the atmosphere they uh, have, could have very important effects in principle now how do we know what the past variations of the cosmic rays are um, we know this because when they collide in the atmosphere they create carbon-14 or beryllium-10 carbon-14 is oxidized and can get locked into the carbon cycle and get into tree rings and then can be analysed as you go back in time. Beryllium-10 settles uh, in ocean sediments or it can settle in snow and can get compacted down into ice cores and then in the, when the ice cores are drilled by analysing the carbon-14, uh, sorry, the beryllium-10 versus depth, you can reconstruct the past intensity of cosmic rays. So now let me show you a few things on solar climate variability. There's a lot of observations of this, of various forms, and I'm only going to show three or four or something plots just to give you a, an indication as to what these measurements look like. The most, the most famous uh, association of solar variability and climate variability is the so-called Little Ice Age, when the sunspots essentially disappeared over this 100-year uh, period, and it's associated with very cold climate, in, certainly in Europe, but also of the rest of the world. The signals of this so-called uh, Monde Minimum or Little Ice Age uh, have been seen everywhere. But the association that seems to occur is that when the sun is inactive, which means low sunspots or long cycle length, that's the space between two of these peaks, then it's associated with a cool climate and then an active sun is associated with a warm climate. There was a second peak 
period here in the sunspot cycle when the, the sunspots were very weak um, that's known as the Dalton minimum and it's very interesting I'm only pointing that out because there's strong evidence that the sun is behaving it started to behave rather like it was in the Dalton minimum we don't know whether that's going to continue but those are the indications at the moment ok now th there have been a huge number of reconstruct. this is uh, a reconstruction of temperature over the last thousand years this is the time scale there have been a huge number of reconstructions of this and they vary in uh, uh, in their, their findings but they, they all rely on climate proxies and uh, the general observation is that there was a cold period the little ice age and a warm period known as the wet medieval warm period there are also direct thermometer measurements from so called boreholes which also confirm that this was a very cold period and this was a warm period so these are actually thermometer measurements deep in the ground very precise thermometer measurements and they confirm this general pattern now the second plot here shows over the same period the variation of cosmic rays it's inverted so these are high cosmic rays and these are low cosmic rays and th there's a general association as you see a dip here and a peak here which is shown here in fact there are many many very detailed temperature reconstructions which even show up this uh, fine grain these are cosmic ray intensities and this is a climate proxy this is actually a glacial, a glacial advance in uh, tropical Andes and this shape corresponding to cold climate here and warm climate here is reflected very much in this this is another plot along the same lines this is now 2000 years and the same association of cosmic rays the blue line with climate the red line this is temperature in central Europe has, seems to hold up ok so that's over the last 1000 or 2000 years and the question is is, is that just a, a, a uh, an anomalous behavior of the sun or has the sun done this before gone into this quiet state this magnetically quiet state and the answer is it's gone into it many times this is only over the last 6,000 years this is the little ice age this is the medieval warm period and this is a measure of solar activity it's actually exactly the cosmic ray variations over this period measured in two different ways and they both agree with each other and this quiet state of the sun has been repeated again and again and again a dozen times or so of the last 10,000 years um, so the grand minima the, this behaviour of the sun is not at all strange it's normal behaviour now are these changes associated with climate well there are quite a number of observations that say they are and this is one of them this is one of the, the clearest but this is so called ice rafted debris this is measured by uh, Bond and his collaborators um, they have measured uh, sediments in the North Atlantic Ocean due to icebergs which had drifted out into the North Atlantic and rained down the, uh, the, the uh, small grains and so on that they ground out when they were part of uh, glaciers so these are examples of these uh, ice rafted debris which rain down, build up a sediment and the sediment is drilled up as a core very carefully and then analysed versus depth the coloured lines in both these things measure cosmic ray variations and the solid lines measure the variation in this ice rafted debris this corresponds to very cold lots of icebergs in the North Atlantic and this corresponds to very few icebergs in the North Atlantic and this is roughly a 2 degree C temperature variation of the surface temperature of the North Atlantic and there's a very very clear association of these things so somehow this uh, cosmic ray intensity is associated with the temperature of the North Atlantic um, this is I think the final one I, I'll show you but this is another example this is a stalagmite that was analysed in Oman which is presently arid but uh, between six and a half and nine and a half thousand years ago it was very wet um, and uh, stalagmite grew, grew in the cave there it's been dated by thorium dating and a particular stable isotope of oxygen, oxygen 18 the variation of that is shown in the blue curve here oh, and it, as I say it's been dated very carefully with uh, oxygen, uh, with uh, uranium thorium dating the grey curve is showing an independent measurement of cosmic ray intensity measured by California bristlecone pines and you can just see for yourself the, the incredibly close association of these two sets of data now there's some tuning in this data within the small errors allowed by the carbon uh, the, the, the uh, uranium dating so there is some, some wiggle matching as it's called 
but the association is, is quite remarkable and this is, uh, this is um, a, a blow up of this little period here so clearly over this period somehow solar or cosmic ray forcing was influencing very strongly the rainfall uh, in this region right so this was um, showing an association of cosmic rays with uh, rainfall in the Indian Ocean uh, over this period, six and a half, nine and a half thousand years ago. Now, I'm going to mention a few aspects of solar variability in the 20th century because that obviously interests people whether there's any effect of uh, current climate change. And by current, I mean 20th century um, and the, the last decade due to the sun. Now, uh, the variation of cosmic rays cosmic rays have been me directly measured in the last 50 years um, by counters prior to that we have to rely on beryllium 10 and the, there was a significant decrease uh, of cosmic rays in the first half of last century which, is a, which has been independently measured by magnetometer measurements which have shown a strengthening of the solar wind uh, over the beginning the first half of last century um, and this caused uh, something like a 20-15% reduction in cosmic rays uh, over the first part so there was a change there but very little in the second half of the 20th century now there have been a number of very interesting observations of the sun over the last few years and uh, I'll explain those in a couple of transparencies the first one is here there's been a, an observation that sunspots are weakening over the last decade. This is a sunspot, this is the Earth, the scale. So these are huge holes in the solar photosphere. They appear dark because there's a strong magnetic field inside. This is the solar photosphere plasma. The plasma is pushed aside by the strong magnetic field. It's a few thousand gauss typically. And uh, it appears darker because it's a slightly lower temperature than the surrounding photosphere. It's not dark, but it just appears that way. Now, some exquisite measurements have been done over the last few years of the magnetic field in that region and the temperature in that region. And this is an example of the raw data. One, this shows the so-called Zeeman splitting uh, of a certain iron line. And in 1991, the splitting was wider than it is in 2002. This is because the magnetic field has decreased and it's the magnetic field that's determining the separation of these spectral lines here. Now there's another observation here and this is an OH molecule which is very temperature sensitive and the temperature has gone down uh, in uh, 2002 uh, sorry the temperature of the, the temperature of the the, this region has gone up and it's reduced the OH and that's shown here. When these data are put on a time series what you see is this is the magnetic field in the dark region, the umbra of a solar sunspot and it's systematically going down. Now these authors observed this in 2005 and this is definitely a failure of the peer review system because their paper is rejected as being impossible. Uh, in fact it's continued and it's now been published uh, here in 2009 and um, if you extrapolate this the prediction is that the sunspots could even disappear there could be no contrast between the sunspots and the photosphere by, uh, by 2015 uh, which is essentially what happened during the Maunda Minimum that period of very cold climate uh, in the Little Ice Age now uh, completely independently the last solar cycle or is it independent? it's probably not independent the last solar cycle, cycle 23 was exceptionally long this periodicity, not only the peak sorry this is showing the total solar irradiance versus time these are satellite measurements measuring the brightness of the sun and paradoxically the sun is a little bit brighter when all the sunspots are present uh, they're overcompensated by the bright regions the faculty nearby but it's about a tenth of a percent brighter than during sunspot minimum anyway this is the solar cycle and it's a long cycle this, is, this cycle is exceptionally long it's actually shown here this is 14 years the average solar cycle is 11 years and this, this is the last very long one like this which was actually in the Dalton minimum so the sun seems to have a very long solar cycle and this very weak solar activity is reflected in high cosmic rays when the sun is at the peak of the sunspot cycle 
it gives a minimum in the cosmic rays. This top plot is measuring cosmic rays versus time, and you see the anti-correlation between the two. This is the so-called solar modulation of the cosmic rays uh, that reach Earth. Okay, but that's not the end of it. Okay, this, uh, this period here, from here to here, a satellite has been measuring the spectral irradiance change. So not just the total solar irradiance, but the spectral change. And that's shown here, and it's between, well, 200 to 700 nanometers. All of the IPCC models have been using the so-called lean model, uh, which has assumed this kind of variation for that period, namely uh, that the, the, uh, there's essentially a uniform change in uh, spectral irradiance over that, uh, that, uh, that wavelength interval. Now, it's just very recently, in fact, in the last year or so, been measured for the first time, and this is the answer, the blue curve. This is what the true solar spectral irradiance change over this period is, and it bears nothing, no relationship whatsoever <coughs> to what's been used so far in all the models. What is seen is a very, very big uh, shift in the, infra in the ultraviolet region, and a negative shift in the visible region. And when this is put together, this band here, anything shorter than this is essentially absorbed high in the stratosphere, and only this part can get down to low altitudes. So uh, the net effect of this, when all this is put in, it's been modeled by Haig, and in the present previous lean model, the forcing at the tropopause, essentially the lowest part of the atmosphere, would have been plus 0.08 watts per, per square meter, but when this true spectral change is put in, it finds that the magnitude is right, but the sign is wrong. Okay. So it just shows how little is understood about the sun. And if this is confirmed, and we have to say it's, not, it, it's only over a short period, we really need to see this over a full solar cycle. But if it's confirmed, then the models may have the wrong sign for solar irradiance for, forcing. It may be a cooling effect at high solar activity. So that means that the present IPCC calculations may be wrong for the solar cycle variations. In other words, that beautiful agreement between the sea surface temperature and the solar cycle, it's a beautiful agreement. The only problem is it's the wrong sign. So it's a beautiful disagreement. We just don't know what's causing the solar modulation in the sea surface temperature. Um, it also means that that small warming at the beginning of the century is actually a small cooling. So it makes the discrepancy between the prediction the model prediction and the actual observations much weaker and it's already poor but it makes it worse so I think we just have some huge question marks about what is the solar, the solar contribution in the century and this, this is only referring to the irradiance variation it's nothing to do with the cosmic ray contribution but clearly we, we have to if there truly is a solar effect on the climate there's some big parts that are totally missing at the moment that we just don't know about. Um, okay, atmospheric aerosols. We're almost into the cloud experiment now, but aerosols are ubiquitous in the atmosphere, but they're extremely important. They have a direct effect. This is the, when you look at the mountains uh, after a sunny day, the haze that you see is aerosol building up in the atmosphere. So they scatter sunlight. Now, they also have a, a more important climatic effect, and that is if you take an unperturbed cloud, a standard set of aerosols, and then add aerosols, you actually distribute that amount of water over more droplets, and that has the effect of making the cloud brighter. So it has a, an increased albedo, and it, more importantly, in fact, it has an increased lifetime. Those droplets are much less likely to coalesce, and the, the, the cloud will live longer and uh, manage to reflect the sunlight for a longer time. So that's the effect of adding aerosol. And this is a photograph, I mean, you recognize this coastline here. This is a photograph of ship tracks in the North Pacific. Uh, these are aerosols which are being thrown up by, carbon aerosols thrown up by ships, which are seeding clouds which persist. So you can see that although there are plenty of aerosols in the sky, they're so, they're, they aren't sufficient. And when more aerosols are added, the sky gets brighter. Now... Only very recently it's been appreciated and it's still not quantified properly but aerosols are also having a strong effect on deep convective clouds. Those are so-called stratus clouds very, um, uh, with very weak convection. These are deep, uh, deeply convective clouds. When you take a pristine cloud, in other words, uh, very few aerosol, 
the cloud tends to rain out very quickly and it gets very weak before it gets to high altitude so very little water vapour is carried up if you add pollution then the droplets are much smaller they don't coalesce the, the cloud gets up above the freezing point there's much more the freezing can occur there's much more, much more invigoration from the extra latent heat that's uh, emitted by the freezing and the cloud carries the moisture much higher and um, there's much um, higher high altitude moisture, electrification occurs, stronger convection and so on. And this has a very big effect on transporting water vapor to high altitudes. And this is the mechanism. These are the mechanisms, particularly in the tropics, by which the high atmosphere receives all its water vapor. So any effect on the convection of water vapor in these uh, uh, deep, uh, highly convected clouds has a very important effect. So there have been observations now to show these effects occur, but they're really not quantified and not understood, and they're not in models. models cloud models uh, very, very rarely uh, include aerosol-type effects, but the aerosols are really controlling the properties of these clouds in a very, very strong way, and they can't simply be represented by uh, you know, white boxes that uh, reflect or absorb radiation. Okay, um, let me skip over this. Well, I, it's such, <laughs> it, it's, it's a very interesting observation, but let, so let me say it very quickly. This is a map of lightning uh, measured by satellites. Lightning occurs very, very strongly over land because it's very dependent on high updraft velocities in convective clouds. Uh, it's very weak over, over the uh, oceans. On the other hand, rainfall, is very much over the oceans, it's dominated over the oceans. So there's a fundamental difference between uh, continental and marine rainfall. And the difference is the vigorous convection that occurs due to the temperature contrast, but also the, the aerosol loading that's very different. It's very low in the marine regions and it's very high over land. And this is a sort of graphic representation as to what kind of differences you can get in, in these cloud properties. Okay, um, where do these aerosols come from? There are two sources essentially. They're known as either primary aerosol or secondary aerosol. Primary correspond to particles that are emitted directly from the Earth's surface. So sea salt is an important one. Bubble, bubbles burst create sodium chloride, which is wafted aloft by winds. Um, biomass burning is very important for uh, carboniferous um, uh, aerosol, direct particles into the atmosphere. Dust is also important. And in industrial sources are also very important around cities and so on. Uh, there's a huge number of aerosol created by industry and by cars and so on. The second type of aerosol is known as secondary aerosol. And this is where vapors are emitted uh, either from anthropogenic sources or from volcanoes or from vegetation or from uh, phytoplankton. And this creates vapors which may get converted by the sun by photolytic reactions into condensable vapors and these can form aerosol from so-called gas to particle conversion. Now that gas to particle conversion is shown here and the reason I'm focusing on this because this is what cloud is measuring in the first step. So it involves trace vapors, they're very very low concentrations, well below parts per billion in most cases, typically a few parts per trillion of the molecules, one in a one in uh, a million million. Um, these may condense, form uh, a cluster, which when it exceeds a certain critical size, can grow by further condensation or even coagulation with smaller particles and grow to the size of a cloud where it can seed a cloud droplet, which is uh, above about 50 nanometers. This process is strongly dependent on the concentration of vapors available, which is controlling this growth rate but also, it's also strongly controlled by the existing, pre-existing aerosol. If there's a lot of aerosol that exists already, then these essentially scavenge these before they get to a size to change the number of CCN. So it's typically uh, remote marine areas where the aerosol loadings are very low, where this process, this gas to particle conversion, can create new particles. And these things are all brought down by various sink processes, either precipitation, dry or wet, Deposition. Typically, aerosols only last a few days to a week in the atmosphere before they're, they're rained out. So these aerosols have to be produced on a, a continual basis. 
Now, the question is, um, well, okay, before we get to that, is that an important process? What's the relative contribution of these so-called primary direct aerosol and the, uh, the secondary aerosol from vapors? And the answer is essentially shown in this model, or this is one, one particular calculation. This is the CCN uh, fraction that's due to gas to particle conversion. It's very high, this is the percentage, it's very high in clean regions, in marine regions. Conversely, where the regions are polluted, they're mainly primary production of particles. This is carboniferous aerosol. And this is the Southern Ocean production where it's very windy and it's, this is sea salt production. Um, okay, now, uh, so it, it is an important process. Gas to particle conversion is responsible maybe for about 50% of the aerosol. Uh, CCN in the atmosphere. It's quite remarkable that such an important process is so poorly understood physically because we don't even know what the vapors are uh, that are responsible for the nucleation. It's thought, it's more than thought, it, it seems that sulfuric acid is always involved. It's a very low vapor pressure, it's very rare in the atmosphere, part per trillion or less, but it has very, very low vapor pressure and it seems to be involved in all the nucleation. But other vapors are also thought to be involved, that uh, ammonia and organic materials, but they're really not, they're not properly understood because so far nobody, okay, so this cartoon is actually showing this, this mole molecules which condense to make these uh, so-called critical clusters consisting of a few molecules, which then by further condensation become a, a sort of liquid drop type uh, aerosol. But this critical step, um, Nobody so far has actually measured molecule by molecule how this thing grows from a vapor. I say so far, we've actually done it for the first time in cloud. The combination of the cloud experiment, the chamber that I'm going to show you, plus some state-of-the-art instrumentation. I mean, these are spectrometers, but they're being developed all the time. Uh, we've actually measured molecule by molecule the growth, and we know what at least some of the vapors are that are involved in this in this process now. But there's a very important step here, and that is that when these uh, embryonic clusters form, they're actually very unstable. Once a cluster, they cluster, they're much more likely to evaporate than to grow further. So there's actually an energy barrier, and when the particle is on, the cluster is on this side, it will evaporate rather than go further. And it has to exceed a critical size, which is actually an energy barrier. Once it exceeds that, then it will continue to grow. So this very, very first step, which is the step that Cloud has recently measured, is the critical step in the, in the birth of these particles that can then in principle grow to become the seeds for cloud droplets. And then finally, the, 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 I've just referred to the molecules involved. The effect of ions from cosmic rays may also help overcome this energy barrier, but that's also been very poorly known uh, prior to our measurements. Now, I'm going to get into the experiment now, and I have to apologize because we've just, you know, in the last three weeks submitted a paper uh, to a certain journal that is very, very sensitive about not pre-releasing uh, results. Uh, so I'm going to give you some flavor as to what we're measuring in cloud, but I can't show you the most interesting things because if I did, that would torpedo our chances with this journal. So um, I'm going to uh, apologize right now that I hope, I, uh, hope that doesn't spoil the talk for you. Um, so what is cloud? Cloud is a large chamber, three meter chamber, and it's located at CERN. It's a very strange experiment. Uh, I think, to my knowledge, it's the first time a high energy physics accelerator has been used for climate research. But what we've done is build a very large clean chamber and we expose it to a particle beam from a CERN accelerator. The, the idea of the particle beam is that it's an artificial source of cosmic rays. I mean, the, the disadvantage of doing an experiment in, in the laboratory, of course, is it's not the atmosphere. The problem of doing the experiment in, in the atmosphere is uh, you observe something and you don't know what caused that change. When you do it in the laboratory, you have a little knob that says beam intensity and you turn that and see a change in your experiment. You turn it down and you see your experiment go the other way. So you have a very, very clear understanding as to you control all the parameters. And the, the parameter that we control at CERN with the beam is the cosmic ray intensity. And we vary it between 
the intensity at ground level up to the top of the atmosphere, which is about two orders of magnitude higher because of the low shielding of the, the air. So I'm going to just step through bits of pieces of cloud. This is the this is the cloud chamber. It has a lot of thermometers to measure its temperature. It has mixing fans to make sure the contents are uniform. It's surrounded in a thermal housing that maintains the temperature to a hundredth of a degree precision and stability. And this is controlled by an airflow which is sent round with a precision thermoregulator unit. Uh, we also have an electric field. This is a transparent electrode on the top and bottom. We put plus or minus 30 kilovolts on that. And when that's on, we sweep all ions from the chamber in about one second. So if we want to measure neutral processes alone, we have the electric field on. When we want to measure the effect of the beam, we turn the field off. Um, we then have a, a UV system, which is quite novel. It involves a lot of quartz optical fibers, which carry in UV light, which irradiate the chamber in a column of UV light and simulate photolytic reactions. We make the sulfuric acid in the chamber by converting oxidizing sulfur dioxide in the presence of ozone. Um, we connect it to a gas system. There's a very uh, special gas system that we've designed that puts in ultra pure air, humidified air, trace gases and so on. Just as an example, we, we can't purify air well enough for our purposes. So we make our synthetic, we make synthetic air from liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen boil off and any of the backgrounds that bother us are frozen out by this so they don't get into the chamber. Um, we expose the thing to a particle beam from CERN and measure it in a, a counter-hodoscope and we continually sample uh, through sampling probes that project into the chamber through a lot of uh, mass spectrometers and various other instruments we continually sample small quantities of air and uh, the, the experiment is essentially like cooking we, we prepare all the ingredients in a big chamber and then simply uh, follow how it cooks with time add the beam and see what happens and we just follow it for several hours and follow the growth of these particles and so on or whatever's happening and well I, I, let me show you a few pictures to give you a flavour for it and then I'll show you a, few, a bit of the data. This is what the chamber looks like on the outside when it arrived before it was uh, put in its housing. This is a 3D view. These are the sampling probes connected through valves to instruments. This is the uh, transparent electrode, the fans, the UV system and so on. And here are some photographs. This is what it looked like last summer. This is the thermal housing, various instruments that are around it. The beam comes in from this side and is about two meters across. When it, uh, two by two meters when it crosses the chamber there. Um, these are the UV fibers on the top surface. This is a disc, uh, picture of what the light looks like inside. This is the feed through design of these things. This is the inside of the chamber. This is the uh, transparent electrode. We have, uh, these are the high voltage standoffs. These are made of zirconium oxide which has no surface charge, it has a small conductivity. We've been very careful that when the electric field is turned off, there is zero residual electric field due to surface charges on any insulators inside the chamber. This is the bottom manhole cover, and this is a view up through the bottom manhole cover of the, with a fisheye lens of the, these are the UV fibers, this is an individual fiber, reflections off the electropolished side of the chamber, and the bottom electrode is there, that's a thermometer. Um, okay, some data and then we're finished. Um, this is an example of one of those uh, gas to particle events observed in the forest in Finland. This is time of day along this axis here and this is particle size, 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers. And you see in early morning, there were, and red means a lot of particles. So in early morning there was a big band of particles in this size range. Uh, and then sometime around midday, a whole host of new particles were, were made from small sizes, grew and grew into this band. So this is a nucleation burst. These things were only first observed within the last 10 years and they're going on all over the atmosphere. Uh, but they, uh, th th this is a uh, particular observation. This is our, w our version of that done in the cloud chamber. And here we're, we're setting up different conditions and then doing, measuring nucleation bursts. Uh, under a different set of conditions and we're repeating it every several hours and between measurements 
we're cleaning the chamber of aerosol, so we start with clean conditions and then we're repeating different, different measurements under different strengths. Um, this is uh, what a typical run looks like when we're doing an online measurement. So these are the control parameters. Always this is time running along this axis here. We start the run by uh, opening the UV, turning on, opening the UV lights in the chamber. When we do that, we set in motion a set of uh, the creation of sulfuric acid. And that's, this is the rise of sulfuric acid in the chamber. And this is uh, three parts per trillion concentration in the chamber. Now, when that happens, this is measuring particles in the chamber in various counters with different thresholds. These are aerosol particles per cubic centimetre in the chamber. So uh, this is 1,000 per cubic centimetre. You can't see it here. If I blew up the scale, you could see it. But particles start to appear, and there's a constant production of particles. This is freshly... These are particles, stable aerosol particles, being generated by this sulfuric acid in the chamber. Um, at this point here, we turn off the clearing field. So cosmic rays have always been going through the chamber. There's no beam, but cosmic rays have been going through. But they haven't been leaving ions in the chamber. The ions have been swept out very quickly. Now the ions are allowed to sit in the chamber, and now they can nucleate new particles. And you see a, a, a very sharp increase in the production rate of these particles. This alone is direct evidence of ion-induced nucleation. And if you can very quickly measure the gradient difference between that and that, you can immediately see what the ion enhancement rate is due to uh, cosmic ray ionization. Now, at this point here, we then turn on the CERN pion beam at a certain intensity, and you see another sharp increase in the production of particles. And uh, this is uh, the... It's basically producing a higher ionization concentration in the chamber, and that's what you see. And uh, th these are various sulfuric acid clusters, which I'll show you in a moment in the, in the next slide, a couple of slides. Okay, so one of the very important instruments that we've got in this chamber that's allowing us to measure the molecular composition of these clusters is uh, an instrument called the Apitof. And th this, for example, is a spectrum of a trimer of sulfuric acid. There's two sulfuric acid molecules and one HSO4 minus uh, ion. So this is actually a trimer where one hydrogen has disappeared and that's why it's charged. The main peak is, is the, the primary isotope of this trimer. But there are five peaks here and they actually correspond to the different sulfur and oxygen isotopes of this, tr this trimer. So not only, we, we, we don't simply measure the mass of these particles, we measure that the isotopic uh, satellites are exactly as they should be, and we can resolve ambiguities where two things normally have the same atomic mass. And just to show you the resolution, this is a particular cluster here, which is labelled there. This is the measurement. This is one atomic mass unit, and this is the prediction based on the known isotopic ratios. So we have extremely precise measurements of these clusters. And this is reflected perhaps in this next plot. This is a measurement of clusters during a nucleation event. This is a binary sulfuric acid a water nucleation. And what you see here is one, two, three sulfuric acids, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, and so on. So this is ten sulfuric acid molecules. This one here is... 10 sulfuric acid molecules plus 1 ammonia. So we know exactly what the ratio is of the ammonia and the pure acid and so on. This is where we added ammonia to the chamber and the 10, actually this is 9 sulfuric acids with uh, 9 ammonias, 8 ammonias, 7 ammonias and so on. So all these data uh, are available to us and they're all part of this paper and uh, I would love to show you some really good plots now but I'm afraid I'm going to show you the summary transparency which is here. All right, so um, what's the summary? Uh, the, the substantial evidence for solar climate variability in the pre-industrial age, but there's no established mechanism. Um, these variations of the climate that are solar-induced are comparable to what's been going on lately. 
Uh, I'm not saying whether they're bigger or smaller or whatever, they're comparable. And we have to understand those if we're to understand properly what's going on uh, with the current climate change. I think the solar contributions to 20th century climate change, are, they're showing some big surprises. They're poorly understood. We, we may or may not know the correct sign and we, do, we may or may not have an indirect contribution such as from UV or from cosmic rays that is just totally unaccounted for at the moment. Cloud is going to hopefully settle the question of whether or not cosmic rays have any climatically significant effect but we also need to understand whether the UV is having an effect as well. Uh, we, we've just submitted our first paper and there's a number of firsts in that paper. We, we, we've made the first time this measurement of the ratio of iron induced to neutral nucleation and it seems to be a very strong effect. Um, we've measured the molecular composition of these critical clusters for the first time and this has given us a, a very clear insight into both binary nucleation and the so-called ternary nucleation involving three components. Uh, ammonia definitely is, is having an effect uh, but uh, there are still, there's still more to find out, much more to find out uh, and in fact in the summer we're going to be adding organic papers characteristic of what fir trees produce uh, and put those into the chamber and see the effect of organics on this nucleation process. Now I have to stress that these, these effects that we're seeing already with cloud only relate to the very small few nanometer size aerosols. They say nothing about CCN about, because they are not at the size where they can seed cloud droplets but it's the critical first step and if there's an increase in the nucleation rate there will be some effect depending on what the conditions are with CCN as, as well but we haven't gone up to CCN sizes yet and then finally I think uh, in my opinion it's very important that we have to quantify uh, what the microphysics is not just the big picture but really the microphysical processes which are not well quantified and not well understood at the moment we've got to quantify how those affect clouds and how uh, the climate may be influenced by solar, solar variability and until we do that, I think we'll have very large question marks about what our understanding is of current uh, contributions to climate change. So thank you very much. Huh? Oh, thanks. <laughs> On one of your slides, you had uh, dimethyl sulfoxide going to sulfur dioxide. That doesn't happen. What, sorry? Dimethyl sulfide? Yes. It's oxidized by ozone to dimethyl sulfoxide and then eventually on to dimethyl sulfone. Dimethyl sulfide is a very efficient scavenger of ozone. So I've seen that a lot in, in papers and things. It's just flat out wrong. It doesn't happen. Say dimethyl sulfide doesn't produce sulfuric acid. It gets oxidized to dimethyl. We use it in, when we do ozonolysis reactions, we use dimethyl sulfide to scavenge the ozone. Um, Second question is. Yeah, that's an interesting statement. Yeah. One, one other question is, we have all these meteors coming in from outer space. Uh, what's the role of these little particles that get burnt up in the atmosphere? I think me meteoritic, meteoritic dust meteoritic dust is the primary source of aerosol high very high in the atmosphere in the high stratosphere in the mesosphere I think it's not significant down at uh, tropospheric levels I mean you can correct me I don't know whether you're familiar with this but it, it's basically not an important source at, in the low atmosphere Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the uh, let's think. Uh, we don't have a lot of gamma rays that are at the one MeV or greater than one MeV level, which is necessary by mass conservation to create a pair of electrons. So it's very very low. I mean these are gamma ray bursts and there are plenty of people looking at gamma ray bursters and uh, uh, there are very few of them. And also, I mean, they actually get absorbed high in the atmosphere. Those, those.
they're not significant at low Yes, thank you. Uh, could you just say a word about what the potential impact is of uh, the theory that you've been discussing on the extent of cloud color cover between the, let's say, the low point in the cosmic ray cycle and the high point in the cosmic ray, ray cycle? Are we talking about a, a 5% increase, a 10% increase in cloud cover, or you know, what sort of uh, extent? And uh, what would the impact of, let's say, suppose there was a 10%, uh, suppose you were, just take a number, a 10% increase, what would the impact of a 10% increase in cloud cover be on uh, the climate? <laughs> well, okay, so two questions. The second po point, if there were a 10% increase change in cloud cover, that's a huge, that's hugely significant, that's a very big effect. Uh, now, uh, but observations of cloud changes, uh, there, there are a lot of people studying that, uh, using satellite data and using uh, the cosmic ray data. And it's very controversial. Some authors uh, claim that there's strong effects. Other authors claim there are no effects. And uh, it's really, I, I, I think the, you, you neither established and it's not written, nor is it ruled out. Unfortunately, all these studies are highly correlated because they're all using the same satellite cloud satellite data, the ICCP cloud data, and they're all using the same cosmic ray data, but they're making different selections and different cuts and so on and coming to different conclusions. Uh, I think it's almost impossible to pick a number out of the sky and say you know, that size. We just don't know at the moment. The original observation by Svensmark and company was a very strong effect. It's clear that it's not nowhere near as simple as that. It is certainly not all clouds at all times. Uh, if this effect occurs, it will be under special circumstances in certain parts of the, the world at certain altitudes and so on. And I, I think it's sufficiently unconstrained at the moment that it's almost like, <laughs> I don't want to sound like I'm advertising my own experiment, but... We, we need the cloud data to essentially point us to where the best place is to look for these kind of effects. And then it's going to be a, a combination of the atmospheric observations plus the cloud measurements to try and zero in and quantify how, what the, what the um, impact is on the atmosphere. But I, I just couldn't actually give you a sensible number as to what it might be. If you take the original, I mean, some of Svensmark's numbers, they, those are n numbers like one one and a half watts per square meter variation over the solar cycle, which is very, very significant. But, but then other people will say there's no effect, so. The first question. Well, the, to, to say that, we have to know what the change in cosmic rays has been. And, I mean, the, the change in cosmic rays was only over the first half of the century. There's been very little in the second half. But, again, you know, if there's a cosmic ray effect on the clouds, it will be instantaneous, essentially instantaneous within days. But if that's happening over a period of a decade or something with a secular change, what does that do in terms of air circulation? What does that do in terms of changing current? What does that do? I mean, these, all these things can have time lags. I mean, ocean currents could easily add decades to it. So it could possibly be, I mean, it can't be ruled out that you could get a forcing in the first half of last century and the impact, the final climate impact, is only felt some decades later. I don't know. I'm not saying that's the case, but I'm just saying it, it's not a simple question to answer uh, uh, what the effects are. The uh, picture you showed of the ship uh, generated clouds is very dramatic, and those, that seems to be effects of the order of 10%. It also occurs to me that commercial aviation has considerable impact. And I recall some similar pictures from taken with the 9-11 uh, event, grounding all commercial aircrafts, they found things. Is there anything quantitative you can say about that? And, uh, from the aircraft. Forcing. Aircraft. Well, both. Ah. 
anthropogenic aerosol production from those two sources, from transport? Okay. Uh, it's true that there was an observation after the 9-11 grounding of planes over the U.S. I think the effect was observed uh, in the nighttime. Namely, it was, it was, there was higher infrared emission at nighttime because the clouds were, 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 uh, were present. Um, but um, uh, what y y your, what's your question? I'm sorry. What was well, it? I, I seem to recall that there were aerosols. I'm sorry, that there were contrail pictures also taken in daytime. Is that? Yes. And in fact, the, all, all these things actually are, are very well quantified because uh, Satellite, there are many satellites now looking at clouds and also measuring the radiation from clouds very carefully. And uh, any of these numbers can be, can be measured and in fact are measured. So I think the radiative properties from clouds are probably on fairly good physical grounds. But the, uh, you know, the actual connection between those measurements and changes in aerosol, it's the changes in aerosol that aren't well understood. Uh, but once the clouds have been created, uh, then the radiative properties are well understood. So, uh, yes, these analyses can be done, um, but there's, there's essentially fundamental aerosol numbers that are totally random at the moment and, and not well understood, both from mankind and from natural causes. Any more questions? Uh, I gather that the variation of the global cloud cover is something that's measurable now. Is that right? Yes. Uh, what sort of variations are there in it? And are there any systematic patterns? Never mind what it correlates with. Uh, is there much variation? I haven't seen the data. Well, the, the um, one of those one of those plots I presented earlier. I don't know. Get back to it. Um, sorry, What's this one. Yeah. The, this um, th this black line here is something called Earthshine. Earthshine is uh, the measurement of the. It's a, it. Uh, Earthshine is a measurement of the uh, reflection of the Earth, the Earth's light, on the Moon. And by measuring the, how bright the dark side that faces Earth, how bright the dark side is, you can measure the reflection of the albedo of the Earth. It's been measured directly for this solid black line here. And then those guys actually compared it with satellite measurements of clouds and deduced that all of their data is consistent with the satellite measurements. And they then took the satellite measurements over the last uh, uh, 20 years or 15 years and re sort of analyzed that in the context of reflection of the, of the uh, albedo of the Earth and came up with this number. So there are, ex there are some claims from all these independent measurements, and this, this is from satellite cloud data, that the Earth's albedo may be changing and that there are systematic shifts. But it's not known why there are systematic shifts, but they seem to be occurring. I was more interested in the magnitude. And you've got uh, anthropogenic effects as plus one watt per meter squared. Yes. Uh, so that this is a, a large effect compared it's a to huge the effect. anthropogenic. It's a huge <laughs> effect with huge error bars. Now, the, there's a feedback on top of that. The feedback may be a factor of two. So you could say the anthropogenic warming over the period of this curve is two watts, essentially two watts per square meter, including all feedbacks. That's the, just the forcing. But two watts per square meter would double that bar, and it has to be compared with these possible changes in cloud cover. These are huge effects, but we don't know what, what's causing those, and we don't, know, we don't know whether they're real effects or whether this was flatter or whatever. But certainly, you know, as an experimentalist, you look at these data and you say the average of all those data, and there's one, two, three, four different sets of measurement, all would say that there's a warming trend in clouds, a net decrease over that period, which may have reversed or may not, we don't know, since 2000. Nobody knows why that should have happened.
Do we have any more questions? Uh, you, can, you can ask another question later. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions? If not, there will, be a, there will be an opportunity for people to meet with Jasper in the boardroom on the other side. There's uh, refreshments provided there for you. And we'll continue this discussion until about 3 o'clock this afternoon for those who wish to. Please join with me in thanking Jasper for his presentation. Thank you.